All right, everyone. Thank you for attending the webinar presented by Gray Capital on Forest Ridge Apartments, apartment community located in Bloomington, Indiana. I'm the president of Gray Capital, Spencer Gray. Excited to discuss this latest opportunity from Gray Capital. Um, we're just going to give it a minute to just allow a couple more people to enter the webinar. And everyone's just getting back from lunch. If you're out here on the East Coast, um, you know, I don't know, maybe you're going out to brunch if you're out in California on the West Coast. Um, but yeah, just give it a couple more minutes, let a couple more people get into the room, and uh, then we will get started. We've got a little bit of just a little preview video we're going to be showing. Um, no audio, I'll be speaking over, maybe trying to dub my voice in real time. Um, and then we'll get started here in a minute. If someone just, just wanted to make sure everybody can hear me, if someone wants to, you know, type in the chat, they can, you're here, uh, you can hear me, and uh, maybe where you are. Um, where are you located? Um, if you're located in the state of Indiana, like we are, or uh, if you're out of the state, East Coast, West Coast, somewhere in the middle. And uh, as William just mentioned on the comments, he will be here also in the chat. Answer any questions if I can't get to it. Always feel free to reach out to myself or William. Answer any questions about Forest Ridge or any of our upcoming opportunities. All right, we'll just give it one more minute and we will get started. All right, just give it another minute or two, just allow a couple more people to come on into the room for the webinar, we'll get going. And, you know, hoping the presentation will probably be between 20 and 30 minutes, try to keep it as short as possible so we can uh, really stick to as many questions, answer as many questions uh, as we can, get into the details. Want to really focus on the highlights, get into as many details, but then you know, obviously there's always, uh, you know, a couple pieces of the granular story that's hard to kind of get to and different you know, investors have different things they're looking at. And so we're, we like to one, know what those things are, what you look at, at in an investment, um, kind of what are your KPIs? What are the things that make an investment look like an attractive investment in your, in your mind? Um, because we're always looking for feedback. Obviously, we have our own criteria and strategy, but we're always looking for feedback of, you know, what are our investors interested in? What type of strategies would they like to see us pursue um, if they are in, wheel, in our wheelhouse and uh, if those opportunities present themselves? So again, this is just a little bit of an overview, a little bit of montage, some shots from Forest Ridge itself. Forest Ridge located down in Bloomington, Indiana. We were down last week in Bloomington at, on, on site, conducting physical due diligence, property tours and inspections. Went very well, waiting to finish up our lease file audit and continue the due diligence process. All right, one more minute and then we will get started. So you're looking at some of the shops, shots from um, the campus of Indiana University, IU Bloomington, which is obviously based in Bloomington, Indiana, just a little bit east of the downtown in Bloomington. Forest Ridge is closer over on the west side, closer to 37 or now new Interstate 69. It's in a really uh, beautifully, uh, beautiful area, you know, surrounded by trees, some nice woods, right next to the interstate as well. Luckily, the trees really block all the sound from the interstate as well as a nice sound barrier. But really, I, I believe a picturesque setting. You see this nice woods, which we'll kind of, we'll get into in a little bit about some ideas, some of our planned property upgrades. Take advantage of this really cool wooded area between the two sites at Forest Ridge. Okay, well, it's 105. Let's get into actual presentation. My name is Spencer Gray. Again, I'm the president of Gray Capital. Um, really appreciate you taking your time out of your, your busy day. Just to learn a little bit more about this investment opportunity. 
we're incredibly excited. You know, this market 2021 has been incredibly um, competitive and difficult. You know, we were looking to do you know quite a few more uh, transactions this year, um, but we we stuck to our acquisition criteria. And, you know, we had to pass on quite a few opportunities and we missed out on, on winning some larger projects just because the prices have been getting, um, they're in the stratosphere to say the least because of all the growth we're seeing in the multifamily market. And so the opportunity to pick up a really solid deal at a solid basis, and we'll get into the details of why we believe that it is a really just fundamentally solid um, opportunity, just from that same point of really buying right, what's in the market, what's going on. Um, got really uh, got us it's really gotten us excited just again compared to where the market is today just before we hop in though i do want to just uh just to highlight some of the resources that we do have at great capital you know for free for not only the members of our investment club but really for anybody um and one of those resources is uh the gray report this has been a project that we started um going on about six months ago after we, we saw the success of our the gray report newsletter um, we call it a multifamily intelligence aggregator. You find it at grayreport.com. And we're basically, we're aggregating all of the latest research reports, um, data sets, news articles, podcasts, video. Every, if you're interested in multifamily investing, you want to stay up to date, um, just highly recommend you just check out this resource every once in a while. Again, it's updated every single day. We cover also macroeconomic news, just real estate in general. Just a lot of great content. And so if you want to stay in the know, looking for one site to consolidate it, uh, great report. That's that's the place it's the place to be. All right, let's just get right into the presentation. And again, if anybody has any questions um, over in the, the chat section, ask those questions. If I don't get an answer to you right away, um, William is also in the chat. He'll be able to answer some questions as well. Okay, let's do, let's dive in. All right, Forest Rich Apartments, as I said, it's located in Bloomington, Indiana. It's 114 units. You know, we're really classifying um, this opportunity uh, as a B class asset. I think it's it, it kind of straddles the line between B plus and A minus. Um, I would say it's definitely uh, elevated above just your solid kind of B class uh, asset. And I wouldn't say it's a you know a solid A either because it was built in the early mid 2000s. Um, and when I think of an A-class property, I think, you know, granite countertops, you know, fully renovated, you know, very luxury. And these are really nice luxury apartments, but times have changed. And so I think this sits really well, this B-plus class, which is a really nice sweet spot in general, but especially in the Bloomington market. Um, I want to talk about some just key project dates. Uh, we put the co project under contract uh, last week. Uh, it was on... Wednesday, we actually went under contract. October 26th, our due diligence is going to expire on the 13th. Um, that's a little less than two weeks. Um, we're hoping to have all our capital commitments due prior to that. Um, and I think this is probably a good point to just mention. You know, we have received commitments in excess of the required equity for the project itself. Uh, we know that some people, um, you know, fall off or change their mind. So we still encourage you to register for the project, uh, express your interest. You can do that at greatcapitalllc.com slash Forest Ridge, or you can email myself or William. Just let us know, you know what you're interested in doing, but you really, after you um, express that interest, you, you want to make sure that you have completed your profile on the Great Capital Investment Portal itself, and that's where you're actually going to finalize your commitment itself, sign those deal documents, um, send us over your verification letter from your either your CPA attorney or a reg SEC registered investment broker, just indicating that you are an accredited investor since this offering is only open to accredited investors. And really the last step is wiring those funds and we will begin to accept accepting funds um, at the end of this week on Friday. We're going to ask all capital contributions um, really are due to be wired in by the 19th prior to the end of the month. Um, and then we're looking to close on December 14th. So absolutely before the end of the year itself. And again, just start the process, graycapitalllc.com slash Forest Ridge. If we are, if we have no more availability for the project itself, I still encourage you to express your interest. Because what that does, it tells us we basically put you on the top of the list for our next project. Um, or our next offering, and we'll be reaching out to you as soon as that comes available. And we've had a couple investors who missed out on our last opportunity, Suncrest, who are fortunately able to participate 
in um, in Forest Ridge. So we're really happy to see that. Again, you know, it's a relatively simple process. We want you to be familiar with the property itself, the investment plan, the strategy, the structure. Um, you can find all of that in um, the, our investment deck, which will be emailed to you once you fill out that form uh, at greatcapitalllc.com slash Forest Ridge. Have any questions, obviously feel free to reach out to myself or William. Make that commitment sign the deal documents the way that's set up it really only takes about five to ten minutes um send us over that accredited investor verification letter and uh, and then the last step is really to fund the project really all the work after um, your work is done after that it's up to us to um close on the project and execute the the business plan which is what we love doing all right just another shot to the front of forest ridge you can see it's uh it's a brick and vinyl construction really nice brick veneer um with the white vinyl um there's really no wood on the property um it's it's pretty much all aluminum vinyl and brick and um you know, the reason of that is it was because of who developed it and how they've operated it so it was built uh, in two phases between 2005 and 2008 um, the first phase was built on kind of the southern portion. There's really two two phases, two sites, all on the same property, um, but there's really two sections: um, the, the north the north side and the south side. Um, the 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 north side was developed first, and then the south in 2005, and then the south side was developed between 2007 and 2008. It's a really attractive um, vintage in our mind, especially at the price per unit. Um, we're purchasing the entire property. It's 114 units for 13,250,000. That comes right out to be 116,000 per unit. Um, and if, if you're following the apartment market, you're seeing assets of a similar vintage trading in the 160s, 160 range plus. Um, we just received a, an op we received a package from a broker for a 70s early 70s vintage um that's trading in the kind of the mid 130s range so we feel like we have significant equity built into forest ridge and um quite a bit we feel like we know we're, we're well well below replacement costs and again that just gives us confidence to know that we're buying right regardless of you know what happens in the future in the market we know that we're buying at that right um purchase price Looking at a five-year hold, projected hold period, um, we have some optionality in that hold period, but we feel like that's the most likely um, time frame for the investment itself. Um, we could hold slightly um, shorter or slightly longer, um, but five years is a good average and, and it's typical for our projects. Average cash on cash, you're going to see a range, and that's because a little bit later on in the presentation, I'm going to show, I'm going to share with you two scenarios. Kind of this first set, this kind of 8.8, .8, um, you know, cash on cash. That's really our minimum base case. And when we were looking at it, you know, I, I, again, there was always a balance of trying to really focus on the preservation of principle and being conservative. Um, but then also just, you know, being realistic. So you can be, you can be too conservative. Um, you know, for, we won the project. We knew we were buying it right. Um, frankly, we, we thought we were a little too conservative on our underwriting because we, we really didn't factor in a lot of what, what we were doing and upside that we know we're going to be able to achieve, still happy with the returns looking at it conservatively. And so the you know, investment deck that you um, probably have already received kind of shows that conservative base case. And we wanted to show just what the, the potential opportunity for Forest Ridge and really not looking at the full upside, looking at really a most likely case scenario. And so that's where that all the way at the 28% IRR, uh, to uh, almost a 3X multiple, um, that that's where those numbers are um, coming from. And, you know, we're going to be financing the, the property. We're going to be closing with a merchant's capital bridge loan. Um, and that's a 30 year amortization. It's a for your term, two years of IO with two years of extension. Um, the plan will be to refinance after that second year for to a permanent um, financing product, most likely a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac product with a very similar terms as the merchant's capital uh, bridge loan. We believe that we'll be, be able to um, receive quite a bit of refinance proceeds when that occurs. We have chosen not to model any refinance proceeds in. We've only modeled really just um, covering our existing loan and just continuing the project with a relatively similar amount of debt service. So in reality, we'll probably get a nice refinance opportunity really in year two. And again, that's upside that's not baked into either of our models. But again, besides the vintage, the basis, um, we're really excited because 
for really two factors. One, it's a mom and pop seller. It's not really mom and pop. It's actually two brothers. They are the ones that developed this back in 2005 to 2008. Um, and not only did they develop it and they've owned it since then, they have been the actual, um, uh, they've basically been the maintenance team as well. So they do use a property management company to handle all leasing activity to, you know, do tours and sign leases. But, um, you know, the two sellers, uh, Don and Bob, which, which we, which meet us down at the property every single time, really just great, good people all around. Um, they're the guys that are changing light bulbs, fixing toilets, doing work orders. And so they develop the property for as easy maintenance as possible um, and have really kind of kept that mantra kind of throughout their ownership and maintenance practices. They've used materials that are slightly a little bit better um, because they don't want to have to go back and fix it because they were literally the ones that were going to have to fix it themselves. So the result is an incredible amount of pride of ownership that shows through throughout the property. Um, when we were down there last week doing our due diligence inspections, they couldn't stop talking about how they fixed since the last time we toured the property, how many things they fixed. And you see that, that, that one tree, we're going to trim it. They want everything to be in immaculate shape prior to us uh, actually closing the property, which is so unique. Most property sellers, they take their foot off the gas and they kind of let things go during a closing period. And these guys, that's just not in their DNA at all. So that that's just, it's, it's refreshing to see. And it's refreshing to actually work with the seller. So often there is a, um, a barrier between buyer and seller and you know, the brokers in between. And a lot of that is because this is an off-market transaction. Now, this was brought to us via a broker, um, but it was not marketed. It did not go through the normal marketing process. We were the first ones to tour the property. We came down with an LOI in hand just because we knew the opportunity, signed in front of uh, Don and Bob, physically handed it to them, and we had the project under contract within just a couple of days. And we just, we just felt like that um, kind of resonated with them. It made them comfortable, and it, it didn't go through a bidding process because of that. What we're seeing in today's market is assets with very high whisper prices, but then being bid up 5%, 10% or more above that whisper price. So that's, that did not happen in this case. We were able to get it right where, where we wanted it. So other evidence of it, it's been a mom and pop operated multifamily asset is the rents are just way below market. Again, conversations with Don and Bob. We asked, you know, what have they been doing on renewals? And they they just kind of chuckled and they said, you know, well, we don't really raise rents much. You know, maybe ten dollars, uh, you know, ten dollars on renewals and maybe twenty dollars on on a new lease. So that's resulted in rents being seventy five to really five hundred plus dollars below per month compared to comparable properties. And there's really two sets of comparable properties: the ones that we think are really good comps, slightly older or, or significantly older, that are still at the similar rent levels or above. And then there's the really the class A comps, which can some are almost double what Forest Ridge is. And Forest Ridge really is in this night sweet spot of there not being that much competition. I'm um, really in this price point and really at this vintage. And so the, the quality and the value, I believe, is, is really there. Uh, the market occupancy and this market fundamentals of Bloomington, very strong, 98% um, market occupancy throughout the Bloomington market. Um, Bloomington, Indiana, we'll get into the market a little bit in a second, but, you know, it's a um, home to Indiana University, as I mentioned a little bit earlier. And um, so there's a, a long, large student population, but, you know, Forest Ridge is not marketed to students. It's a conventional uh, market rate asset. But what happens in some of these university towns is the development is really focused on student housing and student development rather than conventional market rate. So we've just seen an, an undersupply in the Bloomington market of conventional market rate assets, which have just led to this incredible tight occupancy. This is further um, described at the property itself, where we see 100 percent physical property occupancy. There are no available units, um, which while is a great indicator of demand, it actually gives us a little bit of a headwind just to get the project started because we have to wait for these leases to expire to start releasing at higher rents and start doing some of the renovations that we're looking forward um, to do. Um, there's a, a pretty good concentration of lease expirations in the summer. The majority are expiring in July. And so we really have to get to July to start turning over these leases, do an easy mark to market and start renovating these um, apartments as well. 
And, and so we just, we have to wait really until July until we can start turning over leases. And you'll see that in the underwriting here in just, just a minute. Um, and then again, we've got a dynamic value add strategy and I'll get to those details in a second. And what a dynamic value add strategy, you know, means as opposed to just, you know, the value add strategy is that we have some optionality and um, we're going to be doing some experimenting um, and we are going to be able to test the market and really see where we can take it. Um, but again, we're not going to be forced to doing something just because, you know, we've got the money to do it. We're going to do renovations without the ROI. We like to see exactly what our ROI, our, our ROI is so we can really dial it in and, you know, get granular with it and do the right thing for the property and for the investment itself. And then, you know, do we have any, <clears throat> our track record, you know, in the market doing this? Not just investing in apartments and multifamily real estate. I mean, we've got a portfolio of over 9,000 units. Um, but this is going to be our fourth great capital asset in Bloomington. Um, we have one that's literally right down the street. Um, it is a comp. Um, it's an older property built in 1972. Rents, rents are at or above where Forest Ridge, which is incredible to me. Um, but it's a great case study. And I'm going to highlight that at the end of the presentation, what we've been able to do at a very, at a, well, I wouldn't call it a similar property, but a nearby asset in Bloomington. Um, and in general, we do have a lot of strong track record in the market. We know the market well. I went to Indiana University, so I, I lived in Bloomington for four years. So um, we, we know the market quite well. And then just another highlight, skin in the game. What are we doing? What are we putting in? The GP group, we're investing over a million dollars into the project, well over your typical 5 to 10%. We're investing over 1.1, uh, we're right now at 1.1 million. That's 26% of the equity itself. And um, you, you don't see that very typically from a sponsor for that large of a co-investment. Part of that is our confidence in the project. Part of it is, you know, we've been doing well with some of our uh, apartment projects and um, we've got some proceeds we need to redeploy into, into some solid assets. Couple more highlights again, off markets, mom and pop. We are gonna be offering an 8% preferred return like we did, uh, we, what can we do on most of our projects? Um, if you invested in Suncrest, the terms are exactly the same. So an 8% preferred return, followed by a 70-30 split between the limited partners and general partners. We'll hit on some of the fees here in a minute. Okay, what are we gonna be doing? Strategy and tactics. Again, it's a stabilized asset. Um, and you'll notice if you look at other projects, a lot of this doesn't change. You know, we do change things, you know, deal by deal, but we have a similar strategy and similar execution model um, that we've been perfecting over the years. And one thing we always look for is we want cash flow day one. We want to hit that first uh, reporting period and distribution. We want to be, you know, hitting um, that preferred return ideally. Um, and again, we've got a target and dynamic value add strategy, which we'll go into detail in a little bit. Um, but even without that value add strategy, and, and this is why the base case is still very attractive, is there's just a very straightforward mark to market um, opportunity um, where current market rents are and where in place rents at Forest Ridge are. There's a huge delta that needs to be um, needs to be narrowed right away. And that's a very straightforward path to success. And that is what our base case indicates. We're really not baking in the rent premiums that we are going to be receive, receiving from the renovations, which if you look at any other, you know, syndication offering, they're maximizing the renovation premium. We're really not even baking that in on our base case. Again, it's mom and pop. Um, so their management company, they, they, they do a fine job, you know, keeping at least, but they don't do any of the things that, you know, we do as professional apartment operators. That is, you know, charging back utilities, charging, you know, basic market fees. And, you know, I think the only fees they do charge, they charge some pet rent, but, you know, it's uh, it's 10 to $20 versus the market average in Bloomington being really 25 to $35 for pet rent. And that's in addition to a, uh, a pet fee, not a deposit, but a pet fee itself, application fees, late fees. They're not implementing any of these very standard fees that every other apartment um, in the market charges. And that's something to keep in mind when we get to the comps in a minute, is that all of those comps, you almost have to add on those fees to the comparable properties itself, which can add up anywhere between really, you know, 50, it's really in terms of other income, when we look at it, anywhere between 50 and hundred dollars per month per unit between, you know, trash, utilities, pet rent, any other fees that they may charge. It can be, you know, again, 50 to hundred dollars. They're, I think, you know, less than I think $20 on average. 
Um, and, and again, just because we have multiple assets in the market, we're going to be able to share some of those resources from nearby properties. Um, and because, you know, it's a 114 unit property, it's a, it can be a little bit of an awkward size to, ma to manage. It's hard to get a lot of on-site staff. But by sharing some staff but with some nearby assets, we're able to keep uh, our salary and payroll line items, um, you know, really relatively minimum. And again, we know the market. Uh, we know the Indiana market. We know the Bloomington market. Our property manager knows the Bloomington market well. And, um, you know, it's again, it, this is not a new exercise for us. What are our goals for the project? What are we really trying to accomplish at the end of the day? You know, let's take really the all the cool things we're going to do with the property. You're making an investment. What are you going to get out of your investment? First priority to us is preserve the principle. You know, that, that that's again, that's the first and last first, second, last rule. Um, we want to deliver a reliable street stream of tax sheltered cash flow, the target of over 8% annually. Um, so, you know, we will be doing a cost segregation study, um, passing on that depreciation to the investors, creating a lot of you know, paper passive losses. Um, but the reason why there's a little uh, star by the 8% is that we do have some lower cash flow in year one due to those leases expiring in July. I still think we probably can hit that 8%, um, but in that first year, we're modeling it. I mean, you know, a little bit less. And so we wanted to put that asterisk there just to be realistic because, you know, we're just big believers and let's let's model to the reality and not uh, not to the dream. Deliver an IRR to investors of at least 16 percent. Um, I think we'll be able to achieve that pretty easily. And we've got two options in terms of an exit, you know, one straightforward, you know, call it three to five years. We sell the asset, um, achieve our exceed target to return metrics. Option number two, though, and this is always kind of our preferred option, is to refinance the asset probably at the beginning of year three, maybe at the end of year two, return a portion of all of uh, investor capital back. Um, everybody stays in the deal, though, retaining your ownership. You take those you know, tax-free loan proceeds, throw them in another deal, do whatever you want with them, um, but you can really start compounding returns. And really, it's a method of you know, de-risking the asset by you know, taking our chips off the table. And then always, you know, again, we're trying to maintain the Forest Ridge apartment brand, high quality apartment community. Um, they've done a great job. It's got a great reputation in the market. There's no you know, reputational issues at all. If you go and Google, read the reviews, they're all incredibly positive and really above average for most apartment communities in general. Floor, paint, for, floor plan, very solid mix, mix of one, twos, and threes, 50% ones, 25 twos, 25% threes, you know, pretty good uh, uh floor plan sizes um you know the smallest one bed is a fi 587 feet right now the lease rent is 739 all the way up to a 1395 square foot three bed two bath currently being rented at 1129 dollars here's a little overview of what the floor plans look like they're attractive floor plans um you know they they didn't reinvent the wheel i, I would say but very solid and you can look at those in a little bit more detail in the deck, here's a couple pictures. Um, they've got these nice balconies, um, storage units on most of the units with balconies, not all, but on most. In the second phase, they added more square footage um, instead of adding that little storage closet that you can see here um, on that back patio. All right. Other pictures. Um, so you notice, and this will be really referenced back to when we get into the value add plan, which we're going to get on, touch on here in a second, is, you know, the kitchens, um, I, I think the kitchens are in a great condition. Um, they're a little, you know, a bit dated at 2005, 2008. Um, but the countertops, you know, they're not, they're not uh, granite or a quartz, but they're really high quality. And, you know, right now our, um, our plan is not to replace the countertops because they're, again, they're great quality. I don't think we're going to be able to get some, someone to pay 50 more dollars because there's a different type of countertop, but there are some really some minor tweaks that we can do um, to, I think, really elevate, um, including switching out the appliance package, some new hardware, new lighting, LVT floors. Um, but we're starting from a really good place. We're not starting from a you know 1960s, early 70s, even mid 80s built product where you really have to gut the whole thing. Um, but we're budgeting that if we really have to, we could. Um, this is just a kind of description of make up the property. You can take this, take a look at this on the investment deck itself. All right, let's talk about planned property upgrades. This is what we're very excited uh, to do. So there's really two elements. Um, we're going to be adding a, a really interesting, unique amenity 
And then we're going to be doing some, you know, a little bit of deferred maintenance. So there's not really deferred maintenance, more of so we've got some things in reserve. Um, and then we've got some optionality, as I discussed earlier. So the first thing we're going to be doing before we get into the, the unit features is we're going to be installing the, a fit trail. Um, so if you, you may have seen these at a uh, you know, park that you go to, they've been installing them since I think like the mid 80s or so. It's a company called Fit Trail. They make these systems. It's really passive um, exercise equipment that you put alongside of a trail. As you see back in this picture, there's this nice uh, chunk of woods between uh, the two sites, the north and the south side of Forest Ridge. This land, the woods um, that you see here, um, that's been set aside as a nature conservation area. And so what that means is we cannot develop in that land. Because at first we looked at it as, okay, well, maybe we can build some you know, additional townhome units or maybe we can build something right around here. And, you know, we are going to actually still talk to the city if that's a possibility. We don't, we don't believe that it will be, but we're, we're still going to have the discussion. But instead we said, well, what can we do to activate this space? How do we not, you know, get in the way of, you know, messing up the nature conservation zone, but add an amenity and uh, make it interesting. And so we're going to be building a little bit of a walking trail, nature trail kind of through these woods. It's got some nice topography. Um, and then we're gonna be adding these little, these uh, this fit trail system. Um, and, and again, it's, it's unique, it stands out. Bloomington is a big outdoorsy town. And, uh, and again, if people don't use it, it's, it's more of the idea that they can use it and it's not gonna be that expensive. And again, it allows us to stand apart from the competition, have a nice amenity, have a fitness element to it. And uh, again, we, we think it's gonna be a way to just elevate the property and bring it to the next level. Um, let's get into the rest of the, the budget though. So we, as I mentioned, we have some unit upgrades that we're going to experiment with. There's currently one model unit. So out of the 114, there's one non-revenue unit. And since there's only 114 units, having that additional unit brought online, throwing off cash flow moves the needle. So we want to bring that unit online, move to a mini model um, model in which that if there are any available units, we have some staging uh, furniture we can quickly move in to that model, have a little office set up that our leasing agents can move around as well. We were doing another property that's working really well. And that allows us to just, again, maximize the amount of revenue, unit, revenue generating units. So we are going to do a nice renovation of that model unit, new LVT floors, stainless steel appliances, uh, new plumbing hardware, um, we're gonna do, have some, some new lighting, um, but really that's the extent of it. It's the idea is not to throw as much money as possible. It's really to just to elevate it and to just really push past the rent premiums and well, really the market mark to market rent increases, push past, past that and start to compete with the real class A a little bit newer. Again, we don't think we're actually, we're gonna get to the, the real class A, which are renting for you know more than $2,000 a month. We're really shooting for that kind of that $1,200, $1,300 range. I don't think we actually ever exceed $1,300 on average throughout our entire pro forma. Um, but something that's going to really match the demographic, um, what's in demand, and but also keeping it somewhat affordable itself. Once we do that renovation, um, we want to determine what kind of ROI, what premium did we actually achieve? Um, assuming that we do receive that ROI, we're really only shooting for $150 rent premium, which we think is relatively conservative. If we can hit that, we have the funds to carry that out to 31 additional units. Now, the reason we're only going to carry it out to 31 additional units is because when we go to sell it, the, sell the property in five years, we can show the next buyer that we've proven out a business plan, the premium that we're able to achieve on those units and sell the property as a value add opportunity to renovate the additional units. Now, in reality, we may be able to renovate a handful more than 31. You can see that we are actually, um, we're earmarking $12,000 per unit, but it's actually up, it's actually in reality 15,000 because you also see this line item for LVT flooring Regard, we are going to, on turns, replace the common area flooring from carpet to LVT. So we're going to be doing that at the units regardless. We have $12,000 per 31 units available for additional unit upgrades. As you notice, we're not replacing the, uh, the countertops. We're not replacing the cabinets, which are really the two biggest expense. We've got the... Um, LVT covered. So that really leaves a significant amount of headroom in the budget 
to execute the rest of our renovations. So we will most likely do be able to do many more than 31 units if the ROI um, is achieved. And if it's not achieved, if we have excess cash, we can always redistribute that cash back to investors. But we're highly confident we will get that ROI. We will continue out the value add renovations. You also see a couple of other uh, line items. Um, maintenance shop upgrade. We're going to be adding a bathroom to the maintenance shop. There's not currently a bathroom um, in their maintenance. They have maintenance closets, essentially. So we want to add some facilities for our maintenance teams. Um, one of the roofs on one at one of the sites um, is getting a little bit older. It's approaching its 15-year lifespan. One of the sites, they've already replaced 100% of the roofs. But on the other, um, we're going to most likely need to replace the roof at some point during the whole period. So we've earmarked $60,000 for that project. Um, and then just kind of how we're paying for all of this and where's the money coming from. We have two sources of funds. Um, one, we are getting a line of credit from Merchants Capital, um, the lender who on our first primary mortgage. And this line of credit, um, it's a really, it's a great tool because it, it mirrors the, the terms of our first mortgage. So basically same interest rate, same terms, um, but if we can pull on it as needed. And so it does not increase the amount of equity that we need for the project itself. Um, and with, so that increases returns and obviously that cost of capital for the line of credit paying, you know, let's, let's say, you know, 3.4%, you know, versus, you know, if we were raising additional equity for those renovations, be paying you know, anywhere from closer to 15 to 16%, really whatever that IRR is. So that cost of capital is significantly cheaper using a line of credit. We will also be raising uh, $600,000 of cash flow. Um, the cash, we can just be a little bit more flexible with it. Um, and, and again, we like having more reserves and contingency than are probably required. You know, we've learned just through experience, we'd rather overcapitalize a project. Um, returns do decrease slightly, but we would, again, we're, it's all about um, understanding and mitigating risk. And if we can have a nice cash cushion, that just increases the chance of success significantly. Again, we're, we're following that first rule of preserving principle itself. And so that kind of brings the entire budget, including, you know, almost 300,000, basically almost 2,500 per unit for contingency season reserves. That brings the total budget to right at $1.1 million. All right, let's talk a little about the market. Where is this? It's in the state of Indiana. Again, we're based in Indianapolis. We know the state well, we know the Bloomington market well. Indiana, it's a very business friendly state, low tax state, landlord friendly state. That's why we keep doing deals in Indiana. Um, but Bloomington itself, again, like I mentioned, it's a college town population, uh, basically a little, just, just almost a 170,000. Um, it's about an hour drive South of Indianapolis and people ask me, you know, is it, so it's a suburb of Indianapolis. It's not a suburb of Indianapolis, um, but it is definitely adjacent and there are people, there are people that do commute back and forth, but I would not call it a suburb itself. Um, you know, the population growth is definitely, it's, it's, it's increasing. I would say it's very stable. There's been a lot of controversy from the 2020 census um, since all of the college students were in Bloomington when they did the census. Um, so there's, um, it's actually throughout college towns, there's, um, it, it, there's been some interesting articles based on if the census data was incorrect or not. But even with the census data, it is um, growing slightly. Median household income, 61,000 in a two mile radius, but uh, going up to five miles, it's 52,000. So we're in a little bit nicer area right in this two mile zone. Average household size, size right around two people, median age 24. Again, that's prime renter demographic. Again, students in Bloomington, that's gonna skew that younger in general. Household 64,000, the labor force 77,000. Just looking at the unemployment rate in Bloomington, um, we wanted to highlight this just to show just the resiliency um, the experience during the pandemic and just in general, typically um, it is below the national average of the unemployment rate. I believe the unemployment rate in Bloomington right now is all the way, I mean, it's below four. I think it's 3.2, it's 3.4, no mistake. And then job growth also um, is recovering, you know, pretty rapidly and, you know, right now on, on track to track the average job growth in the United States. You know, the one interesting thing about the Bloomington market, and this is just some other market um, market data in terms of, you know, where rents are growing. You know, Bloomington has yet to see a lot of the major rent increases that we experienced um, last, uh, last year, starting in March. And there's really two factors to that. Um, one 
there are a lot of mom and pop owners in Bloomington who, um, like Bob and Don, um, they don't really pay attention to, you know, national rental reports and aren't tracking rent growth. And they're just, you know, tacking on 10 or $20 a year. So Bloomington in general has lagged behind a little bit, although they are starting to catch up. And as you can see for uh, CoStar, that's where this data is pulled from, is anticipating significant rent growth. I um, mean, you know, really starting in early 2022 as they do catch up. And you see that in a lot of tertiary markets, um, kind of that rent growth takes some time to disseminate through to the, some of the smaller markets itself. And the other reason is, again, just the concentration of leases all signed at one point and that need to get those leases signed. Well, and they just weren't pushing rents when they were signing a lot of those leases. And so we believe that in 2022, we're going to see some significant rent growth in Bloomington. But we haven't really priced any of that rent growth into our model. We just kind of looked at where rents were today. Right, just kind of locating you a little bit in Bloomington. Um, if you're familiar with Bloomington at all, you notice, you know, the university is over in this area here. Um, along here, this is 69 or used to be 37. So this is interstate going up to Indianapolis, going south. It'll take you to Evansville, Indiana. I mean, see the star here is right where Forest Ridge is. And um, I, I'll just go to this next slide. It's right across the interstate from really the bulk of the employment, jobs, retail, dining. And it's really all across that west side of Bloomington. That's where the bulk of the employment is. Um, the downtown is further to the east itself. Um, obviously, this is the downtown area. And then you have a lot, again, a lot of great outdoor and nature amenities. We have this really interesting uh Mountain Bike Park, which is immediately south of Forest Ridge right here. We have this Twin Lakes Sport Park, which is right next to Forest Ridge. And then Lake Monroe, Brown County, um, Hoosier National Forest, they're all a short drive um, just to the west and to, or sorry, to the east and to the south itself. Oh, one more, one more thing I almost forgot to mention is uh, the Crane Naval uh, War Center uh, is it's a little bit south. It's about 30 minutes south, but there's there's no housing uh, there. So it's a major a military research um, installation. And again, there's no town. The closest town is Bloomington. And so we have a lot of individuals that work at Crane living in Bloomington. We know this from our other assets in the Bloomington market. We have Crane employees that are living there. And one of those assets is right on the street from Forest Ridge. And we're going to be exploring some corporate contracts with Crane because that's been very successful um, for our other assets in the market. All right. All right. Let's look at uh, the apartment market, again, the what is the competitive landscape? Where are rents at other properties? Um, so we can kind of, again, see where we're going. So there's two dots, and I hope you all can see this um, well. This lower dot right here, this is the current lease rents at Forest Ridge. And this is average of all of the rents. So $907 average rent per unit at Forest Ridge. In our base case business model, you know, we're really moving rents to this 1034, and that would be up to, you know, this dot. You can see at the trend line, we are still far, far below. There's no reason why we shouldn't be able to hit um, this uh, $1,150 mark and really exceed it. Now, we've compared this to um, your construction. And so, again, we're, we're still very much below that trend line. And the one beds... Again, even further behind the trend line, current lease rents 786 for these nice of units. That's just that's very cheap, especially looking at um, year of construction. Again, we've got properties that were built in 1998 that um, 1998 that are you know are just a little bit that are more expensive. Properties that were built in 1988 that are significantly expensive, hundred dollars more expensive. Um, sorry, no, two hundred dollars more expensive. And then you know, we have properties again, even nine, this is a Bradford Ridge. This is built in 1993. It's significantly more expensive. This is literally right across the street. You know, I actually go back to one of these, our previous slides. So Bradford Ridge is the property that's right here. Forest Ridge being right here, literally a couple hundred bucks right across the street itself. So it's a very competitive comp. And then uh, what do we have here? We have our three bed, these are our three bed rents, same story. Same, same story. I mean, really, the only properties that were uh, that are below it are below it just just a little bit. 
and at Oakdale Square, which is a great capital asset. We probably could increase rents over there, although it's doing really well. And then again, looking at this Bradford Ridge, 1475. Even uh, townhouses on 10th, built in 1971 at 1280. And then, you know, and I'm not even mentioning these other comps that are, you know, further down to this range, but just to give you an idea of what is going on in the market and the opportunity. And that's where, that's where we felt we really didn't need to bake in all the additional rent premium. We could really hit targeted returns without it, just moving rents to market. And that's why we have the optionality. Um, that's why we have the optionality of the renovations. Um, so we know we're going to continue them out, but we really don't have to. All right, financial analysis, you know, a little disclaimer, you'll, you'll be able to read this um, in the picture deck itself. Again, cash on cash, base case, 8.8%, 16% IRR over a five-year hold period. We're assuming a five and a quarter percent exit cap rate. It brings us to a 2X equity multiple break even I can see on average over the five year hold period is 64%. Getting into just kind of the structure and the fees. Again, if you look at Suncrest or invested in Suncrest, really most of our previous offerings, it's it's the same story. 8% pref, 70-30 LPGP split. We have a 2% acquisition fee, uh, 1% guarantee finance fee. We have an annual 2% asset management fee. Um, it's based on gross revenue. So it's the performance based fee. Total equity for the project, which we're raising uh, four million two hundred and fifty thousand, and um, so yeah, Nav and I asked about targeted vacancy, and so that, that's where we're, we're looking at that right now. So right now, year one vacancy assumed, we're assuming a five percent vacancy. Now that was with us knowing that the property is a hundred percent occupied until July, so we're still assuming that we'll have some vacancy. Once we get to those lease expirations, we're going to be raising rents. There's going to be some lag on leasing them up. Hopefully, we'll be getting some more units to renovate them because the model unit will be renovated before those leases expire. We're actually hoping for we, – we never want to, want to see any evictions, but we may be having some conversations with some residents. If anyone wants out of their lease early, we may take them up on that opportunity to get in to either renovate the unit earlier or at least get the rents up sooner because that's what we're really waiting on those leases to turn over. After that first year of operation, we are modeling at about a, a just under a seven and a half percent um, vacancy through the rest of the hold period. So moving away from 100 percent occupancy, I mean, if we can continue to achieve that, we may. That's great. But we're assuming kind of a normal um, occupancy. Again, average rent growth over the hold period um, is 6.3%. And that is really just us getting those leases up to market. And then kind of, again, our base case exit cap rate, five and a quarter. And we'll look at a sensitivity matrix here at the end. So again, let's look at cash on cash. This is base case compared to uh, what we're calling our most likely case. Base case, um, this is where in year one, so this is this really displaying this uh, taking time to get these leases up to market. Again, we have to wait till July to lease to turn over. Because of that, cash flow in year one is a little bit lower than we typically like to see, basically 5.5%. But starting to get those leases up to market. And just like on most of our deals, we don't assume we'll get leases 100% up to market by year two. It, we usually model in it taking a couple of years. Um, so by year two, we're going to be in a 9% range. Year three, kind of the high nines, a little less than 10. Uh, year four, still in the nines. And then we'll be double digit cash on cash by year five. Obviously, you know, we look to exceed this. That produces average 8.8% .8 average cash on cash, 16% IRR, 2X multiple. All right. And so then our most likely uh, model, and the only difference between the two is in the most likely model, we do carry out the additional renovations on 31 different units, 31 more units, and we achieve $150 rent premium. With our budgeted um, renovation, our renovation budget, we're confident we can do more than 31 units. Again, we've got 15 grand between the LVT budget and just the, the remainder of the interior budgets to do a renovation that doesn't include cabinets and countertops, which are typically the highest line items. So we may be able to do up to 60 units, which will increase these returns. This is only modeling and doing 31. So again, since be, because we are doing more renovations in the first year, our occupancy actually increases. That's why we have lower cash on cash year one 
Um, again, just our, our, we try to be very granular with our models. But year two, though, because we get that additional premium, we're all the way double-digit cash on cash, 10.24. Year three, we're still t- double digits, 10.35. Year four, 10.58, finishing off in year five, just south of 11% at 10.95. Um, and that... Um, that brings us to an IRR of 18.3% in a 2.17x equity multiple, average cash on cash, basically nine and a half percent. Here's some more, some of our assumptions, some of our sources and uses. Um, feel free to go into this in detail um, in our investment deck if you have any questions about this. It, re- it really underlines a lot of the numbers we've already talked about today, has a couple more of our, um, you know, Acquisition financing information, some of our costs. Um, feel free to ask us any questions about kind of any of our sources and uses, anything like that. And same thing with just our kind of our detailed um, pro forma. Okay, mentioned sensitivity matrices. Um, so this is on the base case. This is not the most likely case. This is just base case. Looking at spreads, you know, really four and a quarter percent cap rate all the way up to six and a quarter. Average cap rate in the United States is four and a half. Today, most assets we see trading are trading in the four to four and a half percent range. We're assuming a five and a quarter. Um, we're buying really at a 4.75% cap rate. So if we looked at what we were actually purchasing between a three year and a seven year hold, we're really looking at a 24 to 17% um, internal rate of return. You know, I, I would say, you know, likely, but, you know, I, I think we're reaching anything o- below a four and three quarter. I think, you know, we're, we're really dreaming a little bit. Is it possible? Sure. And then on the other side, though, let's think of get it closer to 6%, really at 5.75. We're really looking in that 12 and a half to um, 14, the 13 and a half percent range. Um, you know, and so this would definitely be in the lower range of our expectations. Um, you know, and some things would have to be going on in the economy really for this to occur to see so much cap rate expansion. Um, From an equity multiple standpoint, really the range, kind of, you know, the lowest, you know, really possibility again is really this 1.4 and then all the way up to a, you know, 2.69. Now, again, this is just base case. If we use our most likely, these numbers would um, would be higher, but again, just trying to err on being a little bit conservative. Um, you know, if we do better, then that's great. More sensitivity, and it's really is, is really mit- risk mitigation, break even occupancy, seventy five percent the year one, getting it down sixty four percent on average, and we've got pretty healthy uh, debt service coverage ratios throughout the hold period. Last thing I want to discuss is a case study, another asset in the Bloomington market. Um, great capital asset. Uh, we co-sponsored this project with another group here at Asset Management. Um, we've, but we've owned it for going on five years. Bought it for ten million dollars. And this is just just a quick kind of a quick short story. Um, bought the property in for ten ten point one million dollars. Um, executed a light value add strategy on the property. Renovated the units, the interiors. Two years later, we went through, we, we, we refinanced the property, had it appraised, value was at $18 million, pulled $4 million out, which resulted in a um, 130% uh, return of capital. Um, so investors got 100% of their capital back, plus a 30% return, stayed in the project itself. And there's so much cash was still in the deal that cash on cash based on original capital invested, even though the return is now infinite, technically, the cash on cash return based on that original capital balance is still around 10%. 9.8, I think the last distribution we did was over 10%. Um, in my mind, this is it's close to a home run as you can get. Executed, execute the plan, had a solid basis, refinanced, still hold, holding on to the deal. Um, we're projecting if this asset, when this asset sells, we'll be achieving a 5X to the limited partners on Oakdale Square. Now, I don't think that this gonna, is going to happen again every time. This this is a unique uh, circumstance, but we did achieve this. Now, let's go back. We, we achieved this right down the street. Um, Oakdale Square is right here. Forest Ridge is right here. Um, so we, we do like this immediate 
market for for some clear clear reasons. All right, everyone, um, that really kind of sums up the the uh, you know the, our base case of why we think Forest Ridge is a compelling investment opportunity. Um, you know, again, you know, we'd love to, to partner with you. Um, and if you are interested in partnering with us, uh, you know, hop on over to greatcapitalllc.com slash Forest Ridge. There's a quick form to express your interest. Um, and then if you haven't finalized your uh, profile on our investment portal, you can do that and you can sign those deal documents. Really the three things you have to do is sign the deal documents, um, submit your letter from either your CPA attorney or SEC registered investment broker indicating you were an accredited investor. If you did that for Suncrest, you don't have to do it again. Um, and then wire your funds. Um, as of right now, we have commitments in excess of equity required for the project itself. But uh, just past experience has told us a handful of folks often, you know, either change their mind or, or fall off last minute. And so really kind of the the case of, you know, who's going to be able to allow the project is me based on, um, you know, who can get their funds into the project bank account. Again, we will begin accepting funds on Friday. Appreciate it, Navin. Thanks for watching. And again, th appreciate everyone taking their time to watch this presentation. I know I went a little bit longer than I, I wanted to. Um, I, I'm bad at that. I like to speak about things too long, especially if it's something I'm excited about. Um, and, and we are very much excited uh, for Forest Ridge. We really are. Um, if anybody has any other questions, um, I'll stay on for the next couple minutes. Um, just hop on over to that chat feature. Um, and drop it in, you know, Navin asked, you know, why be so conservative with rent increases? I mean, and I answered the target vacancy question. You know, the reason was the reason, you know, being conservative and, you know, we're, it, it's not, it's not necessary to hit our metrics. Um, our idea was, you know, where is, what's the de delta between um, market rents and in, in place rents at Forest Ridge? And that was really what we were targeting for. Can we exceed that? You know, have we exceeded that on other projects? Absolutely. But if we can exceed a 15% IRR and hit our 2x equity multiple and get good cash flow, we don't need to just keep baking things into the model. Now, at the same time, you know, we looked around and said, well, we, we need to know what that, that looks like because that is part of the business plan. You know, what do, what do those returns look like? And so that's why we, we continue to, you know, tweak our model and say, all right, you know, let's say we we carry these renovations throughout and we really do get this rent premium. Um, what does that look like? And again, there's no reason why we can't get a $200 rent premium. Um, but having the optionality, I think is important because I've seen quite a few, uh, a lot of syndicators, they've got their plan. They're going to spend $15,000 per unit. They start knocking out units. They don't get, but they don't get the rent premium. They get a $30 lift and they're shooting for 250 or they get 50 they're sh and they're shooting for the 250 if we can't get the rent premium, there's no reason to make that investment, um, especially if the, if the property is in good condition. The property is in good condition. Um, I'm a big believer in don't fix what's not broken. We don't, and not everybody needs granite countertops. Some assets, granite, it's what it needs. It's it's, it's what the market is demanding. Bloomington is not that market. Um, it just it just isn't. Um, Jimmy, appreciate you watching. Appreciate really appreciate it. Tom, always great hearing from you. Really appreciate it. Um, again, I'll just stay on for another minute. Minute. If anybody has any questions, feel free to let us know. Um, I'll be available via email as well as William. Um, if you'd like to schedule an investment strategy session about Forest Ridge, about the future, um, you know, we've got those links on our website, or again, just email us, and we'll we'll get it set up pretty quickly. Um, you know, if I don't have any other questions, I just want to make another handful of announcements for the people who are still on. Um, this will most likely be the last single asset syndication um, at Great Capital. Um, because of how Suncrest, well, really last, our, our last three projects, Phil's on Fur, Suncrest Apartments, and Forest Ridge, we um, we received more commitments than, we, than were available very quickly for the last, those three projects. Um, and for each deal, we've had investors not be able to participate and we don't like, sure, it, it's effective creating a sense of urgency. You know, we're running out of funds. Like that's 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 fine, and I know you all understand that. And it's like, but it's it's the reality. And what happens is people don't actually get to participate because we don't have enough equity. And so that is a problem. We don't like making offers and presenting opportunities and, and people not being able to participate in them. Um, second, 
we've been at a disadvantage and on the acquisition side of how competitive the market is because we are using, have been using this syndication model of where we have to go out and raise funds for each project. Multiple times this year, we have been bidding on an asset and uh, we're in the third round of bidding, which is typically the final round, excuse me. And um, there's typically a buyer interview where it's between the broker and the buyers and we're all in a you know, Zoom meeting or whatever. And the question always gets asked, I might fill out a questionnaire also, you know, okay, tell us about your capital raise. Who's the equity? What's your, J what's your joint venture partner? Do you have the fund, are the funds discretionary or, or does the capital have to be raised? Now, each time we can, I can tell a great story of, all right, you know, we've been able to raise, you know, $12 million in a, in a, in a few weeks, or, you know, we raised for Suncrest, we raised, you know, $5 million and, and not, we, well, we had $20 million in interest in 36 hours. It's a great story, but it doesn't get a buyer confident that, okay, you've got the money in the bank when there's another buyer who literally has hundreds of millions of dollars in the bank that they have to deploy. So we've lo we lost out on about three incredibly attractive opportunities when we were at the same purchase price, but the only difference was we had to go out and raise the funds, which we like doing, versus they had the money in the bank, whether it was through a 1031 or a big private equity fund, money was burning a hole in their pocket. And so we are moving to a fund model where we will have funds that are pre-committed and because what we've learned is a lot of our investors want to continue to invest with us. They're investing in each of our projects anyway. And they believe in the strategy and our ability to execute. Like, sure, the individual assets are incredibly important, but they've gotten to a point where they, they know what our strategy, they know the assets that we are pursuing. It's a strategy that aligns with, um, with them and with you. And um, we'd rather invest in that strategy than just a particular asset. And so we're gonna be building next, starting next year, an incredible portfolio at, from our fund. Um, it's gonna have anywhere between you know, probably five to seven assets, sticking to our same strategy, stabilized assets, throwing off good cash flow from the Midwest, kind of sitting right in between um, a kind of value add and core plus um, risk return profile, um, where we can really exploit the inefficiencies in the multifamily market to create outside returns based on our relationships, our knowledge of the market um, in the Midwest and Southeast. So, so stick around for more announcements about the fund um, launching in 2022. But before then, we're looking forward to partnering with you on Forest Ridge. Um, and again, go to greatcapitalllc.com slash Forest Ridge or reach out to myself or William. Looking forward to having a conversation with you. Looking forward to partnering with you on Forest Ridge. And again, I, for those of you that are still on here, I very much appreciate your time, full hour, talking about multifamily. I love doing it. I know a lot of you do too, um, but listening to a presentation for an hour is long for anybody. So have a great rest of your day, great rest of your week. If you do want to participate, make the commitment today. The link is in the description, greatcapitalllc.com slash Forrest Rich. Okay, thanks everybody. Have a great one.